If you live in the United States, chances are you will know a little something about football. Even if you aren't a fan, you'll see it in the world around you. The football game is on because of a family member, or it's on the TV at a bar or restaurant, or you're invited to a Super Bowl party, or because right now the most famous person in the world is dating an NFL player. Football's popularity extends beyond the professional level. People also love to watch college football, and high school football can play a large role in local communities. To this day, I'm really not much of a football fan outside of the Lady Gaga or Rihanna halftime show, but as a former high school cheerleader, I myself am a little sensitive to a lot of the issues that a cheerleader might face. So when I came across a certain TikTok, my ears definitely perked up. So I cheer for the Cowboys and y'all, the Cowboys versus Packers game last Sunday, I have never experienced such disrespect from the other team's players to the cheerleaders in my five years as an NFL cheerleader. Mind your own business and start yelling at us. Like sometimes it was this close to our face. Also, I feel like that's unsportsmanlike conduct. I tried looking for any footage to corroborate what she was saying and it seems that I'm not alone. A lot of the internet right now is trying to find evidence of her claims, and until that footage is found, if it's ever found, we may not know what really have happened. Many people, including a lot of NFL fans, I'm sure, feel very safe in calling her a liar. If it happened, there must be some footage of it. Or even if it happened, then good, because she's a Dallas Cowboys tree litter and I don't like the Dallas Cowboys because of reasons X, Y, and Z and therefore she deserves it. Jensen Morrell, a member of the Dallas Cowboys cheerleaders, commented on this TikTok and said, literally was on the verge of tears. And in regards to the disrespect that the Green Bay Packers were showing on Sunday, good. That is exactly what this sport needs. Make fun of the cheerleaders, all right? If they cry, they cry. You know, as Drago said, if they die, they die. If they cry. And if the NFL had a storied history of protecting its cheerleaders at all costs, valuing them and treating them with dignity, I might be a little skeptical too. But unfortunately, that's not the case. Not even a little bit. So today we're going to talk about NFL cheerleaders, the increasingly impossible standards imposed upon them, the unreasonably strict rules that they must follow, and how the NFL has consistently failed them. In the spring of 2018, we were still seeing a lot of stories coming out of the Me Too Time's Up movement. The movement prompted action from women across several industries, but most prominently the entertainment industry. Women were sharing their stories about the mistreatment, harassment, and inequality that they faced at their place of work. But they were not just speaking out, they were taking action. They were filing lawsuits, they were pressing charges, they were putting pressure on executives, managers, and even Congress to make material changes for women's safety and well-being. So I was so surprised, so surprised when a lot of NFL cheerleaders started to speak up about their own experiences working in the NFL. Over the past decade, the lawsuits that many NFL cheerleaders courageously filed allowed the public to catch a glimpse of the lifestyle that they are expected to live and the sacrifices that they are expected to make. And before we get into it, I just would like to take one moment to remind you that the NFL generates anywhere from 12 to almost $19 billion per year, and all of the NFL teams together make the organization worth about $82 billion. In 2014, former Oakland Raiders cheerleader Lacey Thibodeau Fields filed a first-class action lawsuit against the NFL regarding cheerleaders' compensation, alleging wage theft and gender discrimination. Although the cheerleaders were required to attend practice several times a week, in addition to Raiders promotional events, 
they were allegedly only paid for the hours that they were performing on game day. At the end of the 2013-2014 season, she was paid a lump sum of $1,250. In another lawsuit, a former Buffalo Bills cheerleader, or a Buffalo Jill, claimed that she pocketed just $105 for an entire season after paying over $600 for her own uniform. And for the record, making the players pay for their own uniforms is of course something that the NFL would never dream of doing. In the New York Times article, No Sweatpants in Public, Inside the Rule Book for NFL Cheerleaders, former New Orleans Saints cheerleader Bailey Davis talks about the lawsuit that she filed against the Saints. According to Davis, the Saints stations were forced to sell calendars of themselves before the football games. Disturbing allegations of getting groped and hassled are surfacing today in a front page investigation in the New York Times. Inside edition spoke to one of the whistleblowers, former New Orleans Saints cheerleader Bailey Davis. Fans drinking alcohol is often a factor. Bailey says she heard offensive sexual comments all the time. Guys would walk by and say they wanted to know do things to you just bluntly. If you're walking with a crowd and you know people are drinking, it's shoulder to shoulder, you'll get grabbed. Did you share your concerns with the NFL? I shared them with a coach, obviously, when I came back in and I was crying and she just said, you need to toughen up. The Saints had a sales quota of 20 calendars per cheerleader, and if you didn't meet that quota, you didn't cheer. And if you didn't cheer, you didn't get paid. So instead of, you know, just showing up and worrying about their cheer performance, they're worried about selling all of these calendars in order to make money. So some cheerleaders had to resort to buying their own calendars in order to meet that quota in order to cheer. So they're literally paying for the opportunity to make money as opposed to sitting out the game, not getting paid and having to sell the rest of your calendars in between quarters. The Buffalo Jills were also expected to sell calendars of themselves, but their quota was 50 calendars a season. According to the New York Times, they had to buy the calendars in advance for $10 and then sell them for $15, but they were ever so graciously allowed to pocket the remaining $5. I suck at math, but I wrote something down because I would never be able to figure this out. <clears throat> so 50 calendars a cheerleader, that's 500 from the cheerleader that the Buffalo Bills makes from the cheerleader. Then they sell those calendars for $15 if the cheerleader sells all of them, and then that's an additional $750 per cheerleader. So the NFL is now profiting twice from the same calendar. And then the cheerleader makes a whopping $5 per calendar, so that's $250 if she sells all of her calendars. But she's already out $500 to pay for the calendars in the first place. So add $250, again, if she's lucky, at the end, the Buffalo Bills made $750 off of not only their labor, but their image. And the cheerleader lost, at the very least, $250. You made her pay you to work for you. Like seriously, check it out. It's bad enough that this organization that generates hundreds of millions of dollars, if not billions of dollars, pays their cheerleaders in dirt. It's worse that much of their disciplinary measures and punishment comes in financial form too. The contents of the Oakland Raiderette handbook were revealed as a part of the aforementioned lawsuit filed by Lacey Thibodeau Fields, outlining a list of strict rules and punitive fines that cheerleaders must pay. Raiderettes who make $120 per game are to be fined $10 for bringing the wrong pom-poms to practice or if their boots are not properly polished on game day. An additional $10 fine is added for every uniform piece that is missing or not game ready. If a Raiderette is benched, she must forfeit the $125 payment, but is still expected to perform at the pregame and halftime shows for free. I would ask why they don't have any like backup pom-poms and boots and stuff for practice or whatever, but I'm guessing that they would make the cheerleaders pay for those too. And it's no wonder that gender discrimination was such a big part of Lacey's lawsuit. The NFL's gap from the women's pay to the men's pay is one of the widest I have honestly ever seen. And if you're thinking, well, of course, the cheerleader's not gonna make as much as a, you know, star quarterback. I'm not even talking about the players. According to NBC, 
NFL water boys on average make between $53,000 and $60,000 per year. The average salary for a mascot is $60,000 a year. Lacey's lawsuit revealed that if you add up the total amount of hours that a cheerleader works for their team, the practices, the promotional work, the ambassadorships, their game time performances, the average cheerleader made $5 per hour. With that $5 per hour salary, they've been made to pay for their own uniforms, their own travel and lodging for away games, maintenance to their appearance, which likely includes gym memberships, makeup, contractually obligated spray tans, and hair dye, because NFL teams want to have a roster of cheerleaders comprised of the appropriate amount of blondes, brunettes, redheads and raven-haired women to appeal to any kind of man's sexual fantasy. So on a salary of $5 per hour, how is a cheerleader supposed to feed themselves, pay their rent and their bills, pay for everything else that the NFL refuses to cover? Due to the very low wages that NFL cheerleaders make, many cheerleaders have to essentially get a second job. But because of their very demanding work schedule, from practice to promotional events to game days, both away and at home, a lot of the jobs that they could plausibly fit into their schedule are in the nightlife business. But of course, there are many rules against that. Prohibiting cheerleaders from working as dancers of any kind, including exotic dancing, in bottle service or as bikini models. The NFL insists that this is for the safety of the cheerleaders, and they definitely wouldn't want them doing anything that they would consider degrading, because according to the NFL, wearing tiny outfits and posing suggestively should be for the purposes of lining the NFL's pockets. It's only degrading when the cheerleader actually makes any money herself. And that's just the beginning of the rules. As a result of these lawsuits, we've learned a lot about the rules that cheerleaders are expected to follow on the field, during practice, in public, in their own personal lives, and online. According to the New York Times, cheerleaders for the Carolina Panthers, known as the Top Cats, must arrive at the stadium on game days at least five hours before kickoff. Body piercings and tattoos must be covered or removed. Water breaks can only be taken when the Panthers are on offense. I, why? Top cats must leave the stadium to change into their personal attire. In Baltimore, the Ravens cheerleaders were subject to regular weigh-ins and expected to maintain their ideal body weight according to a handbook in 2009. The Cincinnati Bang Gals were even more precise in recent years. Cheerleaders had to be within three pounds of their ideal weight. Even when they aren't on duty for their teams, cheerleaders are subject to specific franchise rules about their behavior. They are forbidden from fraternizing with players or even dine in the same restaurant as players, according to a Saints cheerleader handbook. If a Saints cheerleader enters a restaurant and a player is already there, she must leave. If a cheerleader is in a restaurant and a player arrives afterward, she must leave. They cannot speak to them, they cannot seek out their autographs or follow them on social media. They must block players who follow them, which is apparently very tricky because many players use burner accounts with a pseudonym for privacy. They are not allowed to post pictures of themselves in uniform. The NFL even exerts control over what they wear and how they act when they're off duty. Many teams do not want their cheerleaders wearing sweatpants or jeans when they're in public. They may dictate the terms of their personal romantic relationships as well as the jewelry and nail polish they're allowed to wear. There are guidelines on proper dining etiquette and personal hygiene from shaving technique to vaginal health. I could go on. With the amount of rules that the NFL has for its cheerleaders, you might think that they think of these cheerleaders as prizes worth protecting, or at the very least, helping them keep their image pristine and their dignity intact. Sure, they make them go to the extreme, but it's all in the name of professionalism, right? In 2018, the New York Times broke a story that described the Washington Commanders, a team formerly named after a racial slur, staff allegedly inviting suite holders and sponsors to watch an annual cheerleader swimsuit calendar shoot in Costa Rica in 2013 without approval or consent from the cheerleaders. The article adds, while the calendar's convenient cropping meant that the end product would feature no nudity, many of the shoots were done topless. 
Some women were also told that they would be expected to accompany those high rollers to dinner. Team officials held on to the cheerleaders' passports, which is so normal and so legal. Two years later, commander's executives were accused of creating best of videos of cheerleaders nipple slips and other risque moments from two earlier calendar shoots and circulating it among NFL leadership. And in 2021, Congress even got involved, launching a House Oversight Committee investigation into the repeated mistreatment of cheerleaders at the hands of the NFL. They found that the NFL had, quote, mishandled pervasive sexual harassment and misconduct at the Washington Commanders. According to The Guardian, at the conclusion of the year-long investigation, Democrats and Republicans on the committee released separate reports on their findings. Included as an exhibit in the Republican report was a collection of about 60 emails originally sent from the former Washington Commanders president, Bruce Allen, to other NFL coaches and executives. Purportedly included as evidence, some of those emails contained topless photos of cheerleaders. The images were circulated among Congress through the report, redacted with only thin black bars over some body parts. The Guardian's Katie Thornton writes, While seeking justice for the involuntary dissemination of their bodies, cheerleaders once more became victims of voyeurism. And to make matters worse, many of the men who were involved and responsible for this exploitation are still in NFL leadership today. Contrast those disciplinary measures with those that were applied to Bailey Davis, the former Saints cheerleader who talked about having to sell a bunch of calendars before games. She was terminated from the Saints Station squad after posting a photo of herself on Instagram in a black lingerie top. Her firing was swift, immediate, and not up for debate. While players get to build their own brands outside their role on the football field, cheerleaders do not. Players have the opportunity to rake in money from sponsorships and brand deals, but cheerleaders should only exist in uniform as approved by their coach and that's it. They should be an untraceable ghost in real life. As former Dallas Cowboys cheerleader Debbie Kepley puts it, they own you. Even though they wanted you to be a representative of the Cowboys, you were still just an accessory, a sideline accessory. It's like being a Miss America. You will do anything they say to be a part of all the glitz, the glamour, the cameras, the excitement, and hope. That's where they take advantage of people. I know a lot of people are probably going to say, well, rules are rules. She knew what she was signing up for and she broke the rules. But in the NFL, it seems like there are people who can break the rules and there are people who cannot. And it seems like cheerleaders are always in the category of people who absolutely cannot break the rules. It seems that the NFL is hell bent on penalizing any little infraction that a cheerleader could possibly make. I can't put my finger on it, but it feels like the NFL cheerleader rule books are built on a foundation of believing every single negative stereotype about women. No fraternizing with players because women are just gold diggers and distractions. No posting about being a cheerleader on social media because women just want attention and fame and clout. Cheerleaders must look exactly the way we tell them to because the most important thing to women should be catering to the male gaze. It's 2024. It's crazy to think that like the most profitable sport in the richest country in the world cannot find the will to pay people for a service that they provide, a service that they have asked for, a service that requires a lot of training, practice, and athleticism to perform with precision on a semi-weekly basis. Cheerleading and dancing on a professional level is actually quite hard to do. Maybe it's because it's associated more with women, or maybe it's because when you see it, it's sometimes like not the main act that you go to a football game to watch. But that doesn't mean that they're not talented and it doesn't mean that they're not worthy of compensation. Cheerleading in 2024 may seem like something of an outdated sport. One might see it as an antiquated activity for girls and women to engage in. It's a sport in which you dedicate yourself to men. You cheer for them and you get the crowd to cheer for their benefit as well. Wearing makeup and cute little skirts is a requirement to participate. And a lot of people might think, 
while you sign up to do an old fashioned sport, you shouldn't be surprised if there are old fashioned rules that come with it. But I mean, has cheerleading always been like this? The answer may surprise you. Being a cheerleader was once considered a very necessary, highly respected role in American football, but that wasn't because cheerleaders were dressing more modestly or because they played a much larger part in the game of football. It's because cheerleaders were men. The reputation of having been a valiant cheerleader is one of the most valuable things a boy can take away from college, the nation wrote in 1911. As a title to promotion in the professional or public life, it ranks hardly second to that of having been a quarterback. According to professor of sociology, Lisa Wade, as college football took off in the early 1900s, enthusiastic male students in the then all-male Ivy League organically spilled out of the stands onto the sidelines, becoming the first yell leaders and <laughs> Rooter Kings. <laughs> Some notable cheerleaders include former U.S. Presidents Dwight D. Eisenhower, Franklin D. Roosevelt, Ronald Reagan, and George W. Bush. The status and reputation associated with cheerleading at the time helped launch their political careers. Cheerleading evolved into a more organized sports activity from which women were expressly banned. However, when the men were shipped off to join combat in World War II, a lot of women took their place and cheerleading was no exception. When the men returned home, there were concentrated efforts to drive women out of cheerleading with some universities passing legislation to block women from the sport entirely. According to Susan Barrell in Women's Sport and Culture, supporters of this legislation argued, women cheerleaders frequently become too masculine for their own good. We find the development of loud, raucous voices and the consequent development of slang and profanity by their necessary association with the male squad members. These efforts, however, proved unsuccessful. And by 1954, the first NFL cheerleading squad was established for the Baltimore Colts. Other teams followed suit, hiring full-time cheer teams and paying them zero dollars and zero cents. The volunteer cheer squads retained a wholesome image throughout most of the 1950s and 60s, with long skirts, sweaters, and homemade pom-poms. Until, according to Vanity Fair, one fateful day in November 1967, when a Dallas burlesque performer named Bubbles Cash sauntered through the stands at a Cowboys game wearing a micro miniskirt and carrying cotton candy. Photos from the game show men around Cash going nuts. Local newspapers crowned her the belle of the football. The unexpected sensation did not go unnoticed. Tex Schramm, the Cowboys general manager, shared Cash's flair for marketing. According to Dana Adam Shapiro, director of Daughters of the Sexual Revolution, the untold story of the Dallas Cowboys cheerleaders, Schramm was the one who had the initial vision for showgirls on the sidelines of sporting events. He realized there's a lot of downtime in football. It couldn't just be guys on the field running into each other. You had to turn it into showbiz and the cheerleaders were one of the ways that he turned it into the greatest show on earth. And thus, a new era of cheerleading was born. An era, as you will see, laid the foundation for gender discrimination and exploitation for years to come. A former executive of CBS Sports, Schramm had already tailored the game to the TV era, helping to pioneer instant replay and create the Super Bowl, America's most valuable sports brand. Now, inspired by cash, Schramm reinvented the cheerleaders as sexy, glamorous, scantily clad showgirls, dressing them in the now legendary royal blue halter tops, star-spangled vests, hot pants, and white go-go boots. Andy Sedaris, the director of ABC's Monday Night Football, patented the honey shot, the practice of cutting away from the game in between plays and beaming appreciative shots of the Dallas cheerleaders to millions of viewers across the country. He left in the third quarter, a Ooh. seesaw game, lots of mistakes. I think she was doing that for you, Frank. I don't know, she was very effective. <laughs> did you like that, Frank? I did like that. <laughs> Sedaris admitted that he got the idea for the honey shots because, quote, I am a dirty old man. 
The popularity of the Dallas Cowboys cheerleaders was undeniable and highly profitable. In 1976, the Cowboys hired photographer Bob Shaw to take photos for a sexy cheerleader poster. Shaw was paid $14,000 for his work, and sales from the poster made the Cowboys almost $2 million. The cheerleaders, according to Shaw, through laughter, I might add, I paid them more than anybody with nice catering. They didn't get anything. Despite the money that they were generating for the Cowboys, the NFL, for the television networks, the Dallas Cowboys cheerleaders were only making about $100 per season, or roughly $470 today, adjusted for inflation. Observing the financial success and pop culture victory that the Dallas Cowboys cheerleaders created, many NFL teams began to follow Dallas's lead. George Papa Bear Halas owner of the Chicago Bears, wanted to have his own set of dancing girls to distract fans from a losing season. Cheerleading uniforms across the NFL were shrunk, cropped, and bedazzled. Cheerleading tryouts became a new ritual. Women were asked to come dressed in short shorts and halter tops and free dance to disco so that their bodies could be evaluated and assessed closely. You know, for science. It is at this point I think that a lot of the problems that affect cheerleaders today are born. The NFL had a problem. They wanted to posit themselves as a serious sports organization, featuring feats of athleticism never seen before, the human physique in its greatest form, and the most upstanding employees one could hire. But the cash money from the sexy girls was way too good to pass up. So they needed to find a balance to make it all coexist. Cheerleaders of the era have said that teams, quote, dressed them like <laughs> but expected them to comport themselves like virgins. Teams began issuing their own strict set of rules for cheerleaders to abide by, ensuring that their every waking decision was made with their NFL employers in mind. Weight limits were enforced with very strict weigh-ins, and subsequently, crash dieting and drug use became a common habit. Cheerleaders were forbidden to interact with players, while players were, of course, free to do what they like. They were also now expected to fill any time that they were not performing or practicing to serve as the team's brand ambassadors at all types of events. The NFL using their cheerleaders to whip their male fans into a horny frenzy and then promising those fans access to them at events like car shows and golf events made a lot of cheerleaders feel super unsafe. Some cheerleaders had stalkers and had to move apartments and change their phone numbers with little to no understanding or help from their NFL employers. Many NFL cheerleaders were starting to realize that the NFL had no interest in actually protecting them. The rules that they so strictly enforced were about protecting, of course, the NFL, their brand image, and their bottom line. And I'm sure it was really hard to ignore the financial disparity between themselves as cheerleaders and just about everybody else. Some cheerleaders were paid roughly $10 a game. Others, like the San Diego Chargerettes, weren't paid at all. In between game time performances, practices, and mandatory promotional events, Chargerettes were hosting car washes and bake sales to pay for their uniforms and travel to away games. Many cheerleaders began to reach their breaking point. One former Dallas Cowboys cheerleader recalls being quickly escorted from the field to a waiting plane after the Cowboys defeated the Broncos to win the Super Bowl. Oh God, XII? Is that 12? A game that they were not paid for because it was an away game. The cheerleaders were locked inside the plane where they were forced to sit for hours without food or water. She suspected that Quote, it was because they didn't want us back in Dallas celebrating, going to nightclubs. You still can't convince me to this day that they didn't keep us on that plane on purpose. And apparently, stuck on that runway, a rogue group of cheerleaders assembled, hatching plans to take matters into their own hands. They began making public appearances unsanctioned by the NFL, in shows, and along with other disgruntled cheerleaders from various NFL teams, they even posed for Playboy. They were finally earning actual income. One Chargerette's appearance in Playboy resulted in not only her termination, but the dissolution of the Chargerettes entirely. 
The Cowboys even successfully sued the Playboy photographer that took the photos. Never mind that the cheerleaders probably wouldn't have turned to Playboy for a paycheck if they were paid appropriately for their time and labor. Never mind that the Cowboys' leadership knew exactly what they were doing when they hypersexualized and exploited their cheerleaders for profit. Never mind that across the league, cheerleaders' uniforms whittled down to essentially bikinis and teams began making them dress in lingerie for calendar photo shoots. As Vanity Fair writer Michelle Ruiz puts it, sex might sell, but when it came to the cheerleaders, the message was very clear. The only ones who were allowed to sell it were the NFL's owners. Throughout the years, NFL cheerleaders have really fought hard for better treatment, but every step forward proved to be a battle. In the 1980s, Dallas cheerleaders quit in droves when the new Cowboys owner, Jerry Jones, made plans to make their uniforms even smaller a decision that he actually walked back at the time. In 1995, the Buffalo Jills were the first and only NFL team to successfully unionize and managed to negotiate their way to $25 per home game or personal appearance. They publicly vocalized how they wanted reimbursements for away game travel and something that's been missing from this entire conversation, the ability to have an actual say in their careers in the NFL. However, their sponsors, Mighty Taco, dropped the squad as a result, with Mighty Taco owner Andy Garavac stating, I feel like I've been stabbed in the back by people I thought were my friends. It's not like they work in the coal mines. They are your employees. They are not your friends that you happen to give a little bit of money to. Other potential sponsors only agreed to step in if the Buffalo Jills disbanded their union. Almost 20 years later, the Oakland Raiderettes and the Buffalo Jills sued their teams for back pay. While the Raiderettes were able to settle for $1.25 million, or $6,000 per cheerleader, which like still isn't that much, the Buffalo Bills decided to fire the Jills and permanently disband the squad in 2014. In the years since, many cheerleaders from various teams have fought back in their own ways. According to The Guardian, by the fall of 2020, 10 of the NFL's 26 teams had been slapped with wage theft, harassment, unsafe working conditions, or discrimination suits. With many of those lawsuits still somewhere in the court system, in litigation, trying to reach a settlement or whatever, many cheerleaders have gone public with their stories in order to pressure the NFL. And to me, their frustration is so palpable. Almost half of the NFL teams at this point have been sued by their cheerleaders. And with all this bravery and effort, they've seen very little progress for it. And seemingly, there's no end in sight. When I began researching for this video, I had a thought in my mind. The NFL needs to make a decision. They need to pay their cheerleaders adequately. They need to treat them with dignity and give them what they need to do their jobs. Or they need to let their cheerleaders go. Let them go find another job that will pay them what they need. But I feel like I came to that decision a little bit prematurely. After looking into the NFL teams that have made the decision to cut their cheer squads entirely and learn more about why they came to that decision, I personally don't really think that doing away with cheerleaders is the right call. The Green Bay Packers cheerleading squad was disbanded in 1988. They were cited as a distraction to the players and fans by Packers head coach Forrest Gregg. But ever since then, the Packers have, off the books, used the collegiate cheerleaders of the University of Wisconsin Green Bay and St. Norbert's College. It's crazy how they're like not a distraction when you don't have to pay them. The LA Chargers got rid of their cheerleaders on supposed financial grounds. And of course, we just covered what happened with the Buffalo Jills. The Washington Commanders fired their squad the same year that Congress investigated them for, quote, mishandling pervasive sexual misconduct and harassment at the expense of their cheerleaders. Hmm. Some coaches and owners have pushed to get rid of cheerleaders for, quote, moral reasons. 
Dallas Cowboys coach Tom Landry didn't want what he called porno queens on the field. The Pittsburgh Steelers disbanded their cheer squad so that football could be a quote, family event. Chicago Bears owner Virginia Hollis McCaskey stands firmly anti-cheerleader, calling them sex objects. Of course, all of this just completely rubbed me the wrong way. NFL leadership doesn't even know how to talk about their female employees, let alone how to treat them. If an NFL team has actually gotten rid of their cheerleaders, it's for only one of two reasons. They would rather fire them than actually pay them, or they refuse to have cheerleaders without objectifying them. Which means you don't actually see the women who work tirelessly for you and make money for you as anything other than a cash grab or a body. And that is so pathetic and I'm really embarrassed for you because you have the money to pay them. You're not some little league that is just finding its footing in this world. You're not some startup that's beta testing something. You're an organization with all of your teams combined worth $82 billion. And you don't actually have to see them as sex objects. I'm doing it right now. I'm literally thinking about them as like talented dancers and cool people who have talent. Like you don't actually have to see them as sex objects if you don't want to. And when it comes to solidarity within the cheerleading community itself, it kind of gets a little complicated. There's a lot of cultural friction when it comes to cheerleading. Older NFL cheerleaders often look at this new generation of cheerleaders with derision, viewing their skimpy uniforms and choreographed twerking as something they would never debase themselves to do. According to a former Cowboys cheerleader, Debbie Kepley, they dance like a bunch of strippers. But older cheerleaders also don't like when new cheerleaders try and, I don't know, fight against having to dance like that or speaking up against exploitation or discrimination. One former Chicago Bears cheerleader said in an interview, none of this conversation about the pay, the discrimination, the treatment, None of this is new to me. My feeling is that when you come into a group, you sign a contract. You know what you're getting into. Nothing that you're going to cry about is going to make it any different. Okay, so do you want them to fight back against exploitation? Or do you want them to shut the f up, Kathy? Even competitive cheerleaders who have gained a lot of popularity over the past like decade seem to resent NFL cheerleaders. As someone who has been a part of the cheerleading community my whole life and is immersed in advancing the sport, the recent wave of NFL cheerleaders has been deeply upsetting, says Nicole Lachere, a spokesperson for the Universal Cheerleaders Association. However, in many cases, what these women are doing is not what we consider modern day cheerleading. They're entertainers. <laughs> what the fuck do you mean by that? Honestly, in this wave of allegations that you mentioned, allegations of sexual exploitation, harassment, wage theft. Is that really something that you wanted to have said? Really? I'm sorry about the abuse, but what we do is way harder. I'd be really, really embarrassed if I said that. All this to say that a lot of people, not me because I'm cool, have made NFL cheerleaders out to be these very highly controversial people. Not NFL cheerleading, but the NFL cheerleaders themselves. NFL cheerleaders are kind of like a cultural Rorschach test. We project way too much onto them and we usually project some of our worst impulses. Some people may see them as a fantasy. Others might really resent the fantasy that they've created. Some might think that they are everything they wish a woman was cheerful, smiling, supportive, and otherwise dead ass quiet. Others may think being involved with that is some sort of hindrance to female equality. Others see a beautiful woman and a body and therefore they are using their beauty and their body, therefore it is not dignified or worth respect. I personally don't believe in any of that, but you can tell that all of those ideas are really mixed up in this whole NFL cheerleader debate. It might have something to do with the fact that they're highly visible, we see them a lot, but we don't hear from them. And I mean really hear from them. It is very difficult, if not impossible, for cheerleaders who are paid almost nothing to go against 
a lawyered up organization worth almost a hundred billion dollars. And even until kind of recently, even if things were good, the NFL made it very hard for them to talk about how proud or happy they were to be a part of their team because they weren't allowed to exist online or off the field. In doing research for this video, I did come across some uh, day in the life vlogs from some NFL cheerleaders, which may indicate that they have kind of loosened their social media rules a little bit. Um, I take it with a grain of salt because it's all very, very positive, but. So when you come across a TikTok where a Dallas Cowboys cheerleader is freely speaking her mind, talking about how pissed off she is that allegedly the Packers, who were the opposing team players, were harassing them and how it was not okay with her. We're not used to any of that. In fact, it's like actually quite shocking. The very next day, the Packers uploaded a TikTok in which each player is asked, which teammate would you let date your sister? All but one player answered, absolutely none of them. So I don't know what happened on that day to that Dallas Cowboys cheerleader. I know that a lot of people are out there right now looking for the smoking gun and they are not going to believe this cheerleader if they don't find a clip that they find personally horrific. To those still looking for that, I personally don't really give a f if you ever find it. At this point, it is built into the NFL DNA that the cheerleaders are to remain the cheapest, most profitable return on investment within their business model. It is built into the NFL DNA to believe in the most insidious stereotypes about women to justify their exploitation. It is built into the NFL DNA that the topic of actual respect, not lip service, not NFL promotions showing them off, but actual respect for cheerleaders in the form of livable wages, protection from harassment, and the ability to have a voice in their own profession is not even worth a discussion. I personally don't need yet another example that proves to me that the NFL has failed its cheerleaders. To me, it's perfectly clear that they always have. 